The Tonga volcano eruption is thought to be one of the biggest explosions in recorded history, even more powerful than atomic bombs detonated in nuclear weapons testing. The following shockwave was felt and heard by nations close by, in some cases reportedly shattering windows. The seismic waves were detected by sensors worldwide, even those in the middle of the United States and Canada. In Japan, the Tonga eruption caused concern. The Kingdom of Tonga had been hit with a small tsunami, and it was thought Japan could also be at risk for tsunami-sized waves. I remember that earlier in the day, my friends mentioned a potential tsunami advisory for Japan. I hadn't heard anything like that, and I hadn't received any advisories on my phone, so I quickly forgot about it. I remember being woken up in the middle of the night by my phone blasting an alarm, shortly followed by a siren going off in my town. Japanese announcements came over on full blast through a loudspeaker in my home, echoing off into the night. Terrified and bleary-eyed, checking the safety app on my phone revealed the Kochi coastline was under a tsunami advisory, meaning we should be prepared to evacuate, but didn't need to evacuate quite yet. It was bitterly cold that night, so I threw together my backpack and warm clothes and texted my friends. I had a hard time falling back to sleep. Thankfully, it was the weekend and I didn't have to work the next day. Next Saturday night, I was blasted awake once again by the haunting sound of my phone alarm. My house creaking, my room shaking in the darkness. Then the echoing intercom of Japanese announcements. My area in Kochi had been hit with a level 4 earthquake. I jumped out of bed and threw on warm clothes, grabbed my things and prepared to evacuate. I was unsure if I should run out of the house. Eventually, I received a message that there was no tsunami threat and no need to evacuate. Talking to some Japanese residents in Kuroshio the following days revealed a startling fact. That night's earthquake was the biggest many locals had ever experienced in their lives, certainly the biggest they felt in Kuroshio. It wasn't exactly comforting, considering I'd been in Kochi for a little over a month, and it was certainly the biggest I ever felt. Talking with my family the next day, I came to an interesting realization. One thing we take for granted in Canada is our lack of major natural disasters. Sure, we have the occasional tornadoes, wildfires, and floods next to rivers, but there isn't really anything brutally catastrophic. No natural disaster in Canada is going to kill a quarter million people in less than 20 minutes. I can't say the same for Japan. The Nankai, Tonankai, and Tokai earthquakes are generated by a large fault line east of Japan under the Nankai Trough. A trough in this case is the edge of two tectonic plates. These earthquakes are named and organized by the Japanese locations they impact, are known for their magnitude, which is generally quite high, and are capable of affecting each other. For example, a Nankai earthquake today might result in a Tonankai earthquake as soon as tomorrow, or maybe in two years. In the past, it was not uncommon for multiple ruptures to occur, triggering each other like dominoes. Scientists have been able to discern many patterns from these earthquakes, but even so, the time and date the next one might occur is unknown. Scientists' best guess right now is that a Nankai will most likely occur within 30 years, and the chance of its occurrence only increases over time. The power of the next Nankai is estimated to be over 6 plus on the Japanese earthquake scale, meaning it could have the capability to collapse buildings, shatter concrete structures, and destroy roads. To put it bluntly, it'll shake the living hell out of everything. Nankai earthquakes are dangerous and scary in and of themselves, but the true destructive power of a Nankai isn't necessarily its quake, it's the tsunami that follows in its wake. Kochi has been hit by a powerful tsunami in the past, 
multiple, and the survivors have recorded their experiences. For example, in Edino, next to a Shinto shrine, is a plaque. Not entirely sure the full scope of what the words are here, but what I've been able to translate makes the hair on my neck raise. It describes farms, towns, and people being swallowed by a rising ocean. And most disturbing of all, when the sea would reside, left behind are only barren fields. No amount of contemporary human engineering or technology can stop a Nankai tsunami. The waves are estimated to be about 20 meters tall, which doesn't sound all that big until you experience exactly what 20 meters above sea level looks like. For example, this is about 20 meters above sea level, well above just about every home you can see. This spot here is 25 meters, and putting distance between you and a 20 foot tsunami isn't really a viable option, as the water can race inland as far as 3 miles. A person's best chance of survival is to simply not live near the ocean, or a coastal body of water. If living next to the ocean is inevitable, next best thing would be to run to high ground. Better be quick. The Japanese population is aging. This is to say there is a lot more older adults and elderly, and fewer children being born. Meaning that soon, maybe one in three Japanese people will be over the age of 65. As you can imagine, this will cause a variety of challenges for Japan. The reason I mention this is because in Kuroshio, the majority of people are also older adults and elderly. Of the many industries here, fishing and canning for example, few seem to inspire youthful ambition. I've been told it's hard to find young men interested in further work in these fields. So many younger people move out of Kuroshio to pursue their goals and go to school. I think another driving factor behind this is the Nankai earthquakes. Realistically, building a business, factory, or simply a home along the coast isn't going to be a viable long-term investment. It's not a matter of if the Nankai will come, but when, and considering the 90% likelihood in 30 years statistic, it doesn't look good for the Kochi coast. It's just part of my theory on why Kuroshio, especially the small coastal villages, have a lot of elderly. What's even more awful is that when the Nankai does happen, I feel like most of the elderly people here might not be able to run away fast enough, or worse, might not even be able to hear the alarms. The tsunami towers will help save lives, but I'm saddened by the knowledge that many people won't make it. So in Kuroshio they test the air raid sirens four times a day, at 6am, 12am, 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. Most homes come equipped with a radio to hear town announcements and emergency broadcasts. Tsunami evacuation signage is posted all across the coastal roads and towns. At certain locations, they tell you your current elevation above sea level. Usually it's frighteningly low. These are just some things I've noticed, and it's easy to miss them once you get used to them. But in my first week in Kuroshio, these things stood out to me. I have two emergency backpacks prepared, one that I always bring with me and the other is left at my home. Inside of my to-go backpack I have water, toilet paper, and warm clothes. The one at my house was prepared by the Kuroshio BOE. It contains rope, toilet paper, water, food, bug spray, sunscreen, various first aid equipment, and whistles. Ultimately, I think the two emergency alerts on back-to-back -back weekends were a good thing. I think they help people, me included, realize how prepared or unprepared we would be in the event of a disaster. They have also made me pay more attention to my surroundings, keeping a mental checklist in the back of my mind should a real Nankai ever occur. The Nankai is both a part of life in Kochi and a way of life in Kochi. It's dangerous and terrifying, but to live and work along Japan's coast, it's just something you have to accept. It's something you have to brave. Thank you for watching, and be bold.